In this lecture, we present the basic definition of conditional probability and examine a few problems that illustrate how conditional probabilities can be computed and manipulated for making decisions and inferences in uncertain environments. Well, to continue our understanding of probability as a tool for making decisions and inferences in uncertain environments, we'll need to develop two additional concepts. The first is the definition of conditional probability, and the second is the algebra for applying conditional probability to problems of statistical inference. Well, to illustrate these important concepts, we'll look at four problems from the textbook Introduction to Probability by Dmitry Bertsikis and John Sitsiklis. Well, let's begin with problem 14 from chapter 1. What we'd like to consider is a situation where we roll two fair six-sided dice, and because the dice are fair, each of the 36 possible outcomes are equally likely. What we'd like to do is determine the probability that we roll doubles. We'd like to determine the probability that we roll doubles conditioned on knowing that the sum of the dice is four or less We'd like to determine the probability that at least one roll is a 6. And finally, we'd like to determine the probability that at least one roll is a 6, conditioned on knowing that the two dice landed on different numbers. Well, one way to approach this problem is to view the sample space for outcomes in the way that I've shown here. On this side is one roll of the die, one of the die, the outcomes 1 through 6. This is the other roll, outcomes 1 through 6, and each dot represents one of the 36 possible outcomes of this experiment. Now, if we want to determine the probability that we roll doubles, we'd like to look at all of the possible outcomes for which we obtain doubles, and that would be a 1 and a 1, a 2 and a 2, a 3 and a 3, 4 and a 4, 5 and a 5, and a 6 and a 6. So if we assume that these each of these die are fair, then all 36 possible outcomes are equally likely. So the probability of seeing doubles is the number of ways in which we can obtain doubles, and that's 6, divided by the total number of outcomes in our space. So that would be 6 divided by 36, or 1 sixth. Now let's take a look at the probability of rolling doubles, conditioned on knowing that the sum of the dice is 4 or less. Well, to do that, we're going to look at this very important relationship in probability theory. And one way to write this relationship is that the probability of the intersection of two events, so both event A and B occurring, is equal to the probability that A occurs conditioned on B occurring times the probability of B. Now we could have written this as the probability of B conditioned on A times the probability of A. Now this probability, this conditional probability, is actually defined through this relationship. That is, the probability of event A occurring conditioned on event B is the ratio of two probabilities. The numerator probability is the probability of the intersection happening, that is, that both A and B occur the denominator is the probability that the conditioning event B occurs. So for this problem, we want to look at the probability that we see doubles conditioned on the sum being 4 or less. Well, with this relationship, that's the probability that we see doubles and the sum is 4 or less, divided by the probability that the sum is 4 or less. So the probability that the sum is 4 or less, again, every possible outcome is equally likely because it's a fair dice. Well, how many ways can we have a sum 4 or less? Well, we can have a 3 and a 1, a 2 and a 1, a 1 and a 1, 2 and 2, 1 and 1 this way, 1 and 2, 1 and 3. So if we count those up, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 ways out of 36. So that's the probability that we see a sum that's less than or equal to 4. Now the way that we can get doubles and have the sum less than or equal to 4 are just these two events, so that's 2 out of 36. Now we can write that ratio instead of 2 over 36 divided by 6 over 36 as 2 over 6, and this is an important way we'll often go immediately to this representation, and that is we'll look at all of the ways that the denominator 
event can happen. That is that the sum can be less than or equal to 4. And we'll put that in the denominator, in the numerator, all of the ways that the numerator event can happen. And that is that we can get doubles and we can have a sum less than or equal to 4. Now this special case, of course, is for the situation where all possible events are equally likely. And of course that's going to be equal to 1 third. So the, the probability that we roll doubles condition on knowing that the sum of the dice is 4 or less is 1 third. Now let's determine the probability that at least one die roll is a 6. Well the ways in which that can happen would be anything along this column and anything along this row and anything along this column. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that's 11 out of 36 possibilities. Everything's equally likely. So that probability is 11 divided by 36. Finally for this problem, let's determine the probability that at least one die roll is a 6 conditioned on knowing that the two dice landed on different numbers. So the probability of at least one 6 conditioned on them being different is the ratio of the probability that we have at least one 6 and they're different divided by the probability that they're different. So let's look at the probability that they're different. That would be anything off of the diagonal. So we know there are 36 possible outcomes. There are six things along the diagonal, so we have 30 on the off diagonals. So the, the probability that they're different is 30 out of 36. Now the probability that at least one is a six, that's anything on this first, this top row, and this bottom column. So there are five here, five here, so that's 10 out of 36. Again, we could have just counted up all of the ways that they could be different, put that in the denominator, all of the ways that they could be different and have at least one six, and put that in the numerator, that would be 10 over 30, or one third. Let's take a look at our next problem. Suppose we toss a coin twice, and Alice claims that the event of two heads is at least as likely if we know that the first toss is a head than if we know that at least one of the tosses is a head. So we're going to answer three questions. First, is she correct? Second, does it matter? Does it make a difference if the coin is fair or unfair? And finally, can we generalize Alice's reasoning if she's correct? Well, let's take a look at it this way. On the first toss, we can have an outcome of heads or tails. On the second, heads or tails. So the four outcomes for this experiment would be heads on the first, tails on the second, heads first, head second, tails first, tails second, and tails first, head second. Now the probability that we see heads on both tosses conditioned on seeing heads on the first toss is the probability of both of those events occurring divided by the probability of the conditioning event. Now the probability of the conditioning event that the first toss is heads would be the sum of these two events. Since all of these events are disjoint, the probability of any combination of them is the sum of the probabilities. Now we don't know if this is a fair coin or not, so we don't know what numbers to associate with these two, but we do know that it's the sum of those. The probability of seeing heads both times and having heads on the first toss would be this event. So this ratio is whatever number we associate with this probability divided by the sum of these two probabilities. And that would be the probability of heads and heads divided by the probability of heads and tails or heads and heads. Now, let's look at the probability of getting heads on both tosses conditioned on having at least one head. Well, that would be the probability of the intersection of those two events divided by the probability of the conditioning event. In this case, the probability of the conditioning event of at least one heads is these three. The only place where we didn't get at least one head would be if we had tails and tails. The numerator, the probability of heads and heads intersected with at least one head is again just this event. So this probability is the ratio of whatever probability is associated with heads and heads divided by these three. 
Now, if you recall, in the first case, it was the probability, this probability divided by the sum of these two. Now, because the sum of these two will be less than or equal to the sum of these three, we'll have a smaller number in the denominator here than we have here. So this probability will be larger than this probability. And Alice is correct. Now this is happening because this event, heads followed by tails, union with heads followed by heads, is a subset of heads, tails, union with heads, heads, union with tails, heads. So here's this event on the left is this part of this set. And a general statement of Alice's reasoning would be if an event A is a subset of B and B is then a subset of C so that A is a subset of both B and C, because B is a subset of C the probability that B occurs will be less than or equal to the probability that C occurs. And that implies that the probability of A conditioned on B will be greater than or equal to the probability of A conditioned on C. Let's take a look at problem 16 from chapter 1. Suppose we have three coins. Coin 1 has heads on both sides. Coin 2 has tails on both sides. And coin 3 has heads on one side, tails on the other. And we'll assume that regardless of which coin we toss, either side, both sides are equally likely to appear. And now let's suppose that someone chooses a coin at random, tosses it, and the result is heads. What can we say then is the probability that the opposite face of that coin is tails? Well, let me set up a description, a graphical description of this experiment. The first thing that we'll do is select one of the coins. So we could select coin 1, we could select coin 2, and we could, or we could select coin 3. And since we said we've done this at random, without any other information, we'll assume that each of these actions are equally likely. So we have a one-third probability of selecting coin 1, a one-third for coin 2, and a one-third for coin 3. And then we're going to toss these coins. So if we have coin 1, we'll toss it, and we'll either see heads or heads. For coin 2, we'll see tails or tails. For coin 3, we'll see heads or tails. What we'd like to determine then is the probability that coin 3 had been selected because that would be the situation where it would have tails on the other side conditioned on seeing heads. Well, using our rule for probability, our algebra for probability, that would be the probability that both events happen, that we have coin 3 and we see heads divided by the probability of seeing heads. So let's first evaluate the denominator. There are one, two, three, four, five, six events, and everything is equally likely. So we're going to see one of these six. The likelihood of seeing any six possible outcome are the same. And there are three places where we could see heads. So that would the probability of seeing heads is three out of six. The probability that it's coin three and heads, well, coin three and heads is one out of the six possible events. So the probability that it was coin three or that the other side is tails, if we see heads, is one third. Well, finally, let's take a look at problem 17 from chapter one. For this problem, we have a batch of 100 items that are being inspected by testing four randomly selected items. If any one of the four is detective, the batch is rejected, otherwise it's accepted. We'd like to determine the probability that a batch is accepted if it contains five detective items. Well, let's see how we would graphically depict this situation. Now, in the first test, if there are five defective items, we have five chances out of 100 to reject based on our first test. Well, there are 95 non-defective items, so we have 95 chances out of 100 that we would accept at that point. So 5 out of 100 is the probability of rejecting at the first test. 95 out of 100 is the probability we will go forward. At this point, there are only 99 
items left. We've tested one, so there's still five defective, so the probability that we're going to reject is five out of 99. The probability we'll move forward, continuing to accept, would be 94 out of 99. Now we have only 98 elements left, so the probability of rejecting at this point would be 5 out of 98, and that is conditioned on getting this far, and the probability of continuing to accept would be 93 out of 98. Now in our fourth test, there's only 97 elements left. We'll reject. There's 5 out of 97 left that would cause us to reject, and there would be 92 out of 97 that we would accept. And if we make it this far, we've completed four tests, we'll accept the entire batch. To work through this problem, what I'd like to do is set up a set. I'll call it A sub n, and that is the event or the action that we accept the nth test. So that we moved this way, A1 would be that we went here, A2 is doing this, A3 is going here, and A4 is our final accept. Now the probability that we accept is that we accept this first time, and the second, and the third, and the fourth. So it's the intersection of those four events. Now let's use our rule for probability and we'll do this sequentially. The first thing we'll do is condition A4 on all of the others, on the intersection of A1, A2, and A3, and then we'll multiply times the probability of those three events happening. And then we'll do this again on this probability. We'll replace the probability of those three events happening with the probability of the third except conditioned on the first two times the probability of the first two. And then we'll apply it again. And ultimately, this is the probability of accepting on the fourth conditioned on having accepted on the first three times the probability of accepting on the third conditioned on accepting the first two times the probability of accepting on the second, conditioned on accepting on the first, times the probability that we accept on the first. Well, this probability is 95 out of 100. And then conditioned on accepting on the first, the probability we accept the second is 94 out of 99. And if we accepted the first two, the probability we accept the third is 93 out of 98. And finally, the probability of accepting the fourth conditioned on having accepted the first three is 92 out of 97. So this probability is 92 97 times 93 over 98, 94 over 99 times 95 over 100. And that works out to about 0.8119 or about an 81% chance that we're going to accept even when there are five defective items in the batch of 100.